story. We wanted men. everybody welcome to another edition of the smugglers galaxy podcast with me as always is jason jason how you doing this morning hello there how are you hello there happy birthday happy birthday jason how are you thank you yep i'm doing our, great yeah it was uh we just found out this week that jason and i have birthdays a day apart his is the fifth mine is the sixth so we got to this is a sort of a special edition of the podcast so it's our birthday edition birthday edition I'm not wearing my birthday suit, so nobody worry. Oh, yes. Thank you. And, and we don't <laughs> see each other, so that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> what did you get? I didn't get a whole lot. Well, actually, I didn't get any Star Wars. Well, the only thing I got Star Wars-wise was uh, we were at a, uh, a little store in downtown Woodstock, and, and Mandy kind of disappeared for a little bit, and she came back. When we got home, she got some of those Kellogg's, the little spoon premiums they were giving away a few years, like in the – Oh five, I think 2005. Yeah. Um, uh, that's a, that's a lightsaber with a spoon on the end of it. And, you know, she right at this point, she just knows that if she buys me something like that, I don't have it. And it, it goes into the collection. So, um, you know, and I got a little bit of cash, so we're going to go hit the uh, flea market this morning and we'll see where, see where the day leads. Awesome. How about you? I sent my wife the link to Amazon when they were running that $20, uh, dark saber special. Uh-huh. So I got the dark saber, which is a pretty cool toy. It's better than I kind of anticipated. I thought it was just going to be like a cheap thing, but when you turn it on, the blade lights up like a lightsaber from the from the hilt up to the top. It's pretty sensitive, so when you swing it around, you stop midair because um, some of those expensive lightsabers they they don't even do this. It kind of makes that sound like it's hitting another lightsaber. Some of those more expensive lightsabers. They're not as sensitive, but this one's pretty sensitive. So it's kind of cool. Um, and I think it's easier for a child to use their imagination to pretend they're swinging and hitting someone. I probably should have picked it up for 20 bucks. I've seen it. it I've seen it go down to like 24 right now, but uh, I think 20 is right where that lightsaber needs to be. Um, my mother-in-law gave me a series of prints. Uh, so it looks like Darth Vader's helmet, but if you get really, really close to it, the the detail is made up from every single line of dialogue from the movie. Oh, wow. Which is, which is cool. And you have to get really, really close. It gets so small and tiny that if you don't know the movie, you don't know what you're going to be reading. That sounds cool. Yeah. And then the other thing I got that's really cool, I got a vintage Return of the Jedi um, lunchbox from from early 80s with uh, like the animated style Ewa, uh, excuse me, animated style Wicket with uh, R2-D2 on it. Oh, that's awesome that it had the thermos in it. No, it didn't have the thermos. I know those are, those are the tough things to get, but I'm glad just to have that. Right. Those are cool. I, I like those. I uh, was able to pick up my wife a Gremlins one probably mm. four or five years ago for like dirt cheap. And, you know, when it, it, it's just one of those things you pick them up when you can find them, but those are cool to have. I did get one more thing and it's kind of funny because Mando Monday rolls around and they released the vintage collection Mandalorian on with a, his Beskar armor and I decided to order pre-order that. And on my way out to checkout, I loaded in a Razor Crest. So I was able to get one of those. But then life happened and I forgot to tell my wife. And I open up my last present, which she told me to open last. And inside is a printed thank you note from Hasbro. And it's half of it. <laughs> I, got, I got half of my present now and I'm getting the other half at Christmas. But uh -huh. she, ordered, she ordered me a Razor Crest. <laughs> Dude. well shit yeah so i'm gonna see if i can cancel my original one and keep the one she got for me oh that's awesome but but as i was telling the story my son's starting to dance like oh he got two of them maybe he'll give me one so there's some debate between me and my wife as to if we're going to keep that second one and not tell him until next year oh that's awesome um, we'll see we'll see yeah i was hoping i'd get the cash to, to back that i was talking to my wife and 
you know, just debating it. And the same conversation we had last week on that Razor Crest where, you're, you know, it's like, it's an awesome, awesome collectible. But yeah, I'm going to be kicking myself and for not getting it. And they just hit the 17,000 mark. So everyone's getting the Jawa with the egg and the off world Jawa um, vintage collection figure. For 350, you are going to get three figures with that thing. So there's, you know, $30, $40 just right there in figures. It feels like it's a better value than the Katana Java Sail Barge because you're getting all those extras. I think they learned their lesson when they did the other stuff. Uh, when they did the, is it the, I see, when they did this the last time, the Centurion? Centurion or whatever from X-Men? Uh, Sen- yeah, the Sentinel. Sen- Sentinel. Yeah, they didn't have any unlocks, I don't think, with the Unicron. And then they tried the Cookie Monster thing, and that failed miserably. And in Unicron, they just freaking extended it yeah. a, month, a couple of months until they reached their goal. That was like do not fail kind of thing for Hasbro. I don't think they wanted that to fail, so they were going to make sure that was a success no matter what. Yeah, I've got a I've got a buddy that purchased it, so I can't wait to see it because you know it's just going to be huge and massive and ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it was real tempting for people to buy two of them because you can leave one transformed and one, you know, one in robot mode and one in planet mode. But that that one is another just ridiculous looking toy. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I did make a target run uh, earlier in the week, and I got some of the Gal- uh, Galaxy's Edge, the uh, stuffed animals that they okay. were dropping because um, they those were hard to find because they only dropped like one item, you know, one package of them per store or something. And uh, I was able to uh, pick up the Wampa and the uh, Loathe Cat and an Ewok, which is our, our favorites from that bunch. And you yeah. know, they're really cool because when you squeeze them, they make noise. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And they've, there's three different noises for them. So they're, they're pretty cool. My wife kind of lost, lost it when, you know, they, they st- she squeezed the Ewok and it talked to her. And she's just like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's coming home. It's, yeah. Well, no, I, she, I texted her. She, I bought them when I was out and about. Uh, I took, I had a little break at work, so I swung into the Target, and uh, they were there. And I sent her a picture. I'm like, "Which one you want?" She's like, "Get them all." And I said, "Do you realize there's six of them?" And she goes, "Oh, we'll just get these three. Because so, <laughs> I was like, you know, because you know when you, they add, it adds up fast. Yeah. And then I did another uh, Target run coming home yet uh, Thursday, and I uh, was able to pick up Hondo's Black Series that droid. They had it sitting. Kind of mismatched, uh, mispriced, so I was able to pick it up for ten dollars, which wow. you know, I was, yeah, I was pretty excited about that. That's a steal. Yeah, um, you know, I kind of challenged them a little bit, and I thought they'd they'd say no, but they they were like, okay, sure, whatever. Look at you with the deals. Uh, because yeah, I, when I opened that droid, I wish they should have had something more with it for that twenty five dollar price point, because you know, at least with Chopper, you had the um, the flame, so you can get a little bit more playability or posability out of it. That's and this true. one just this one's just a droid. Yeah, you're paying for the exclusivity in that one. All those uh, Black Series from Target, you're paying the extra five bucks just because they have it and they had to pay Hasbro to get it. I don't know. I'm not happy with the way that things are going with the pricing on Black Series. I really think that uh, you're going to that $25 mark now that they've started to charge that, you're not going to get away from that because uh, GameStop was charging like $22, $23 for them. Yeah, Walmart's charging that for all of their exclusive Black Series figures. Uh, yeah, and it's seventeen dollars for their carbonized vintage collection figures. The little, the three and three quarters, seventeen dollars. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, they're bleeding us. Damn you, Hasbro. But they know we're gonna pay it. If, yeah, if you want the collection, you got to pay for it. Anything else fun and exciting? I did pick up the BB H two O, which is Disney's um, holiday droid. It's a BB eight figure, but it's white and and red. It, they do this every um. Halloween and Christmas, they come out with like a holiday themed droid. So I missed the Halloween one this year, but I did pick up the Christmas one. Yeah, I like the uh, Halloween one from last year where it was the black droid with the skeleton painted on it. That was a cool one. Yeah, I did pick that one up. Yep. The R2B2 or Boo2 or something. Yeah. R5 Boo or something. Yeah. That was a cool one. It's probably like Boo19 because they usually try to add the, the year on it. So this is like BBH20 for 2020. Oh, I also picked up, um, if you're a member of the Galaxy's Edge fan group on, on Facebook, there's a guy there that's been making patches of the coasters um, from Olga's Cantina, and I did pick up the T-16 Skyhopper patch, which is pretty cool, too. So that's it for me. 
which is a which is a lot, I guess. Yeah, it is a lot when you you got two razor crests. Two razor crests, yeah. Well, just make sure your son doesn't listen to the podcast, and you'll be all right, though. Uh, he's too busy with Minecraft. He's not going to listen. Okay. <laughs> Freaking Minecraft! Oh God. It's better than Fortnite. I never even got into Fortnite. I'm just I've still played Madden 19. I think is the Madden version I got. I'll I'll play Madden until I get bored. You're not bored with it, but you know you'll. When I find a good deal on Black Friday on Madden and I'm walking and it's 20, you know, I'll see it for 20 bucks. I'll pick it up, and but I'll play it for three or four years before I update. Yeah, I'm still playing Grand Theft Auto Five. I love stealing the cars and stealing the planes and just flying around. I just, that, that's enough. That's good enough for me. Yeah, because I've played like Fallout 4 and stuff and it just feels, it feels like you keep repeating. Yes. You know, it, yeah. it's like, oh, go over here and do the same mission you just did on this part of the land now you got to go do it over here and yeah it it just it you know i, I know football is repetitive too but it, it, i guess it's a different kind of repetitive right uh, but i do i do want to get squadrons i've been toying around with that and I'm, i guess i'm just too cheap because i know once i buy it i'm gonna have to get the playstation um live to be able to play it in multiplayer and i just you know i'm just cheap because it's like 60 bucks a year I found that on Target for 25 bucks for both uh, PS4 and Xbox. Well, I guess I know what I'm doing after the show today. Go and pick that thing up for $25. Because that, from what I understand, it was a decent game at $40, $25. Uh, wow. I guess I know where I'm going now. Thanks for yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm, I'm always happy to spend someone else's money. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what I get told all the time when somebody's like, here, one of the guys uh, up in New York is like, here, buy this. And then when I thank him, he's like, I love spending other people's money. Bought some stuff uh, that he pushed, kind of pushed me to buy, and he kind of emailed me, messaged me. He goes, "Dude, say this and end it." And I kind of, yeah, I hemmed and hawed, and I kind of took a little bit off that price and just said, "Here, this is what I can do." And the guy was like, "All right, fine, they're yours." Oh, you know what else I did this week? I completely <laughs> forgot. So I have a, a, a pretty. A, I kind of mentioned this. I think what, last week I have a crappy Darth Vader costume, and I wore it to work. They had a costume contest. I got second place. I got fifty bucks. And then on Deal or No Deal, the Facebook group, um, Ross Barr listed a Black Series, I don't know if it's a prototype or a color um, test for like the colors that they actually use for the figure uh, of the old man Han Solo. So using what I got from that and a little bit extra money, I was able to pick up a Black Series prototype figure, which is something I've been wanting for a while now. So I'm pretty excited about that. Deal or No Deal is a cool website or a cool Facebook group if you guys don't know about it. They got crazy stuff like that. Black series. So it was. Were you just wanting a black series, or you wanted that specific Han Solo? I, I wanted that specific Han Solo. I want Han Solo, and I, I had to jump on it. Deal or no deal has kind of got everybody through the uh, quarantine and through 2020. That's been the the shining star of 2020. Yeah, I think the only other black series prototype I might be interested in is the Gamorrean Guard, if I could ever find that. All right, and thankfully those are older figures. Well, that old man Han Solo that is kind of hard to find because I've heard that the you know, the, the stuff from the newer stuff. Well, I guess if that's from Force Awakens, it wouldn't be too hard. But from the right. last, you know, it's gotten harder and harder over the years because yes. they've, they've started Hasbro has, has Dest- really tightened the reins on that. Yeah, they're starting to destroy prototypes. I mean, I would also love to have a, a short, short Trooper Black Series prototype, but I think it's from Rogue One on that they started destroying most of the stuff that they make as far as prototypes. The point I was trying to make is that Gamorrean Guard, you'll probably have a pretty decent time, a pretty easy time trying to find it. I hope so. Well, cool. Congrats. Did you pick it? Did, did it come in yet? Not yet. No, uh, it should be coming in this week, this nice. coming week. Yeah, and you got but, it from Ross, which is a cool, he's a cool guy. Yeah, I trust him. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's one of the good ones. Plus, yep. he runs CAS, so that helps out. Yes, yeah, exactly. It's not a fake. Jason, what did you think of The Mandalorian this week? chapter 10 which was called the passenger it was difficult to get into after coming off that last episode with all the hype in it oh i mean it was it was a fun episode um i think the running gag with baby yoda throughout the whole episode was 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 fun yeah but yeah you're right after last week's episode i knew this was going to be like we talked you know it would be a little bit of a downer but uh, yeah i when it ended i looked at my wife and i was like they ended it like this and then I kind of, so I tried to set my expectations going into this, saying to myself, this is not going to be as good as the previous episode. But when it opened up on Tatooine, I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe this won't we'll just jump into where we left off. And it really didn't. 
that that opening sequence on Tatooine, you see him speeding, you know, just flying on that speeder bike, and you see the gang of, you know, people getting ready to set up a trap for him. I'm like, well, maybe these guys are working with Boba, and Boba wants yeah. to get his armor back, and maybe we'll, this will start off. Yeah, it was just some guys after the child. As soon as you heard, get the child, you were like, crap. It's not Boba Fett related. And one of those one of those pirates or marauders or whatever you want to call them, bounty hunters, looked a lot like a character that was in The Force Awakens. Did you pick that one up? I thought that was a Jawa at first. I was like, is that a Jawa? Because it was about the same height. And he, he sounded like he was speaking Jawa to me. Yeah. And then it, somebody had confirmed that it was somebody from Force Awakens. Yeah, it was a guy that, I don't know if it's the same guy or, or the same species or, or what, but it's a guy that kind of threatens Ray while she's cleaning one of the um, pieces of salvage in the beginning of the movie. He kind of gets in her face. That was a cool sequence. I thought it was fun because, you know, when the, when the Mandalorian is like, okay, take, and he speaks, it's weird hearing him speak because when he wants to like get a point across, it's like he knows how to speak and he speaks really well and he uses big words and, you know, he's like, oh, there's this rat, you know, this wreckage is valuable. There's value in this wreckage. And, and then the guy points and wants to jetpack and I'm thinking, why the heck would you want a jetpack? And then when he takes off and the Mandalorian, you know, hits his button on his, on his gauntlet, you're like, ah, oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, and it takes off and, and, you know, he kind of falls and, I guess he dies or gets knocked out and then the jetpack comes back to him. And, you know, that was kind of funny. The, the comic relief in this, in this episode, I think kind of helped, helped keep it going. Yeah, I agree. But I, I kind of took it as that, that character who has had the knife point to the child. He was just trying to save his life at that point. I don't think he really wanted the child. I think he just wanted to get out of there. Yeah. That would make sense. Cause the Mandalorian did kick everybody's ass. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it was a cool, that, that was a cool fight. You know, you, you're learning, like I said last time, the, he's learning his armor and, and he, you're definitely, you're seeing that the guy knows how to fight and take care of himself. When he goes back, he, you see him and uh, when he walks into the uh, cantina, I was sort of like, oh, I, he's back at the cantina because you see the, the things and you see the, the droid, Jabba's the, the torture droid from Jabba. Yeah, and uh, it's the bartender. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, cool, he's back on in the most Eisley. And then I, after I said it, I went, he's been there all along. He's been there all episode, dude. You know, he was there last week too. But you know, I just got excited because of that callback, and you're, you're paying more attention this go around to the callbacks. The whatever, what's what's the lady that runs the docking bay? Is it like Potty? Maybe uh, Patty or something along those lines. Yeah, the the girl that looks like she went from New York to Tatooine. Amy Sedaris. Yeah. She she really does feel like they took a New Yorker and threw him in Tatooine. Well, she's playing Sabacc with that uh, doctor, whatever, with that big beetle creature. The praying mantis guy, which I appreciated because there was a character in the original cantina scene just like that, but he was so far back that I don't think anyone really picked up on it. So it's just bringing a, another original trilogy cantina creature up to the forefront, which I think this series does great. Yeah, and another thing I really appreciate with this, this show – and I think they're doing it better than any of the other movies that Disney's made. They're incorporating characters from all lines of Star Wars, from the sequel trilogy to the original trilogy, even to Rogue One. I, I don't know if you picked up on it, but there was that big white hairy guy that was in Rogue One. He was in the cantina. Yeah, I did see that. That was yeah. uh, I, I noticed that that one pretty much right away as, oh, that guy. Yeah, he's from Rogue One because uh, yeah. they did. You know, that was one of those background characters that I guess Hasbro picked up on and thought it was going to be bigger than what he was. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he made a toy out of him and made a play set around him, and he was only in the film for like, you know, 10 seconds. What happens is when they're making the toys and when they're making the movies, Lucasfilm will just send people, send Hasbro pictures. So they've got to pick and choose which character they're picking, you know, or making. They have no context as to who they are. So that's why you'll get a background character. The Hasbro will pick up on it and make a toy out of it, and you only see him in the, in the movie for ten seconds. And that's how we got Blue Snaggletooth. They sent Lucasfilm sent Kenner a picture of Snaggletooth, and they decided to make, and it was a black and white photo. So they only had the chest up, and they just assumed it was a tall guy. The movie came out, and they were like, "Oh, that guy's short," so they had to make the red snaggle tooth, which is more screen appropriate. That's how we get the blue snag. And that's how we get toys that are more valuable because Hasbro changes something because Lucasfilm didn't like it. But yeah, that was cool to go back to the cantina and to be there and 
see all those creatures and I, I love that that place that 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 entire set so once they're done with their sabat game they go back to the hangar and they were cooking the dragon meat and how were they cooking the dragon meat the pod racer pod racer throwback to galaxy's edge I, yep. I pointed that to the wife i was like look how they're cooking that meat and she's just like what do you mean i said look and she was just like oh my god just just like ronto's roasters yeah that was cool then they introduced the the passenger so then they um long story short mando figures out that he needs to go to the system to find more mandalorians and he finds out he has to take a passenger with him to the system which her husband ends up is on the system and then her husband will tell him where to meet the mandalorians and the lady has got her spawn she's a frog like creature and she's got her spawn on the back on her back in a little container water filled container and of course they're all eggs and the whole time you know and of course baby yoda sees the eggs and and you could almost hear the 80s love story music kick in every time baby yoda's looking at those eggs yeah like the dreamweaver sequences from wayne's world dreamweaver I kept hearing that in my head when, when baby Yoda was looking at those eggs and they kind of hinted at it a little bit, but it wasn't, you know, too bad. Yeah. That was a good running gag or well, I guess I'm going to spoil some of it, but yeah, he starts eating some of those eggs throughout the episode. And that was like the punch at the end too. He's, he has one last egg. Right. And he's just like, bloop. Yep. Just shoving it in. I really don't care what you tell me to do. I'm going to eat this. So that, that was that was probably the thing that saved the whole show. That that whole episode for me was that running gag with Baby Yoda and those eggs. I like how they only referred to her as Frog Lady, the passenger, mm-hmm. which is very reminiscent of the old names of Walrus Man and Hammerhead. It was just kind of what the character is plus their, their gender. So it's Frog Lady. I only heard him mention the planet once where they were going and it was towards the end of the episode. Did you catch it, the mentioning it any, any more? No, I don't, it didn't stand out to me. So I don't think it was anything familiar. It, it wasn't. Cause I tried looking it up and I either misheard it or didn't know how to spell it. And I could never find it. Yeah. Cause I'm just curious if where they're going is that water planet that we keep seeing. A lot of the, the stuff that I've seen in the trailer for, for the season was in that, this past episode. So I think they they saved a lot of unseen footage for later this season. So it wouldn't surprise me if the next episode has some of that water village stuff. Yeah, and it would make sense why he was on a boat and you never saw the Razor Crest because the Razor Crest is, is... It's pretty damaged. That's another thing going back to the Hasbro Razor Crest where I'm like, are they going to fix it or is he scrapping it? I mean, that's his Falcon. I don't see them abandoning that ship at this point. Gotcha. Because it is, it is pretty torn up. Yeah, those X wings are pretty cool to see. Who was because uh, they had Dave Filoni was in one of them, which was cool. Yeah. Uh, who was the other guy? I think he's just a new character. Uh, it's not because in the season one, those were directors. Those was Deborah Chang, Rick Fukushima. What was his last name? And Dave Filoni. Those were directors of of that season. I don't think this gentleman um, directed anything. I think he was more of an actor this year. Okay, cool. And and they did kind of, I like, I enjoyed how they kept the just, I'm bored. This is just business as usual. You know, they were almost, they were acting like a cop versus yes. a pilot of an X-Wing. Yep. That whole series or that whole interaction, that whole scene, I really enjoyed it. That was probably my favorite scene out of that whole episode when he's, you know, that they're talking and they're like, well, you need to do this. And then, oh, hold on. I don't have that piece of equipment. And he's like, well, we may have to you know, take you back in and he's, Oh, hold on a minute. And he flips the switch and, and there it is. And, and then you see him talking and then go, Hey, swap to can, you know, channel two. And then all of a sudden you see the X wings. Yes. That was awesome. Seeing them uh, open their X foils or attack foils or whatever they're called. But that was just an awesome part of the episode. Yeah. And, and then, you know, you're like, uh, shit's about to get real when those things popped. Here we go you were able to watch the Mandalorian, how he knew how to pilot that ship. Cause you know, it does seem like it's a, it's a big old honking, you know, ship that can't fly, but then watching him fly it at that sequence in that sequence, you're like, I guess he does know how to fly it. Yeah. And when they were in that Canyon, when he's flipping it around, that, that was very reminiscent of the Death Star trench and a new hope kind of had that vibe. Uh, going back to canyons. Do you think he was going through beggars Canyon on that speeder bike? 
It's possible. I mean, it was never identified. Sure. Let's make yeah. it so. <laughs> we'll yes. say it was yes, Baker's I Canyon. <laughs> I didn't see any Womp Rats, but yes, we'll say it is. That definitely did have a Death Star run, you know, trench run feel to it. And watching him pilot the, the, the ship was, was great. I don't know what they were trying to do with the fade to black and fade up. I mean, you know, they kind of bring in different, I guess, eighties elements to the, to the show. And I think that was just borrowed from the eighties. Cause you know, or I guess it's just a time lapse thing. And they're like, okay, we're going to fade to black. And then this is what happened while, you know, while we were in black. I guess it's just passage of time. They're trying to communicate some time has passed since the crash, but I don't know. I guess it was a bummer to me because you're expecting so much out of this ice planet and he was there for half a half an episode. Cause yeah. uh, uh, you know, you do you, all the previews was him on this ice planet and him going through this, the Canyon of the ice planet. And, and you saw him with the snow on his, on his uh, armor and they were there for five minutes. But it seemed like a throwaway episode where nothing really much happens. We really don't establish much. Um, it doesn't propel the story forward. He's just taking someone to another planet and he gets sidetracked. This has nothing to do with Mandalorians or his mission or anything like that. But I'm wondering if those X-Wings will come back later in the season. And that's the tie, the overall arc of this, this whole season. Those is the introduction of the X-Wings and the pilots and the relationship between the Mandalorian and the New Republic. If he's fighting remnants of the Empire, are, are, is that how it's going to come back where the, the New Republic helps him um, defeat the remnants of the Empire? You know, they've brought him back one from last season. Well, why not bring him back again? Especially when you got Dave Filoni as, you know, one of the pilots. Yeah, it's like they always say, I guess it was Hitchcock. You introduce the gun in Act 1 that you're going to see in Act 3. So are they introducing the X-Wings in Act 1 that we'll see in Act 3? Uh, that's my thinking. Yeah, I don't, I don't think this is the last we've seen of Cobb Vanth from the last episode. I think he's going to come back at some point, especially when he's like, you know, if you ever need any help, let me know. I got your back. Yeah. And speaking back of Cod Vant, I did see a picture of the damaged jetpack and the fixed jetpack, and there's definitely that silver band that I saw on it that was was the repair. You know, yeah. it's fast. Yeah, when he's walking over from – when he's trapped out in the desert walking to Mos Eisley on his way to the cantina, there is a shot where you see the jetpack, and it's got – a silver plate like you just mentioned on the back and that's a really good shot of of that repair job uh yeah and, and while he's going back to watching him I, i'm watching him walk through the desert and part of me is going i hope that armor has air conditioning because <laughs> <laughs> you know that was hot yeah but but that's the way he's got to wear it be you think he would just kick it off but no he, he sticks to it and uh that's the one thing that 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 the frog lady uh for a lack of yes yeah, if they're gonna call her frog lady let's call her frog lady when she uh, tapped into that droid and was able to communicate with him. That was cool too. Um, because, you know, when it, when he wakes up the Mando, you're kind of, even cause it is, cause it was during one of those fade to black sequences where you're fading up and the droids talking to the Mandalorian and you're like, what the hell did she active? You know, what's going on? Yeah. Some time has passed and she's been able to hack into it and, and, access its translator so they can talk because the Mandalorian doesn't even talk her language and he tries hot teas and it's just met with silence and they just there's a communication barrier and she finds a way around it by um, accessing that translator and, and she's able to talk and then the droid's able to translate in English for her or basic I guess it's not English it's basic in the Star Wars universe the one thing about this episode it definitely it may have been boring but it kept you on your feet like the last you know you were trying to figure out what was going on yeah you know, and when she disappeared and found the little bath, you know, and of course, Baby Yoda, he's he's going to be a, a little, you know, jack jackass for lack of better term, because he's hungry and he's going to find something to eat. Yeah. You know, and he gets that spider and eats it, and uh, you know, you're like, ah, oh, you little a hole. Here we go. Yeah, he's always thinking with his stomach. The child. Yeah, which makes him kind of cute, but what are you gonna, yeah. He's just, he's going to get into trouble. I thought this was the stronger part of the episode when they're in that cavern and the the child is hungry and starts to go out and eat another egg because it seemed a lot like like scenes from Alien. Uh, Ridley Scott, Scott's original Alien movie, this is a lot like that with all the eggs hanging around. And the, even the way it peels open was like the, the face huggers when they those eggs would open up and... Um, it kind of gives you some anxiety because, you know, in Alien, those things will jump out and grab your face. So it's like, is that going to happen here? 
what's going on. I thought you might like this episode a lot because it's a throwback to, to Rebels. I did. I, I, I saw those and I was like, oh, crap. They're, those are Rebel spiders. Mm-hmm. I kind of remember that in Rebel, I, I thought they were force sensitive, but they, I guess they're not. Uh, they just had force fields that they didn't like. So I was kind of hoping he could get back to the ship and kick on a force field or something. Yeah. And it wouldn't, you know, they'd back away. Yep. That was cool to see them all kind of open up and start crawling towards the Mandalorian. And this is, again, we're going back to what I said a couple of weeks ago about how Star Wars can be different things. This is, this is as close as Star Wars can get to horror. And if you like that kind of thing, this is a great episode for that. Yeah, it was. I did like, you know, like I said, I like the callback to Rebels. I like the callback to Galaxy's Edge. They love doing their callbacks and they do it good. The giant spider comes crawling out and it's just like, oh, there's, there's Mama. Mama's angry. It starts chasing them all. She definitely was angry. And then at the end when that other big spider came out because he blew up Mama, it's yeah. like, was that Mama or was that Daddy? You just, you couldn't really, you couldn't get a good picture of it. Yeah, then that's when all the blasters start happening and the Mandalorian walks out and cause the whole ship is being attacked They're They're trying to get into the cockpit so they can seal the hatch and, and protect themselves. There's a giant hole in the side of the razor crest and the Mandalorian is, you know, trying to protect frog lady and the child. Um, and they kind of lock themselves into the cockpit and data comes and starts breaking the glass to the cockpit. And that's when laser fire starts blasting off and the Mandalorian walks out and he sees that the two X-Wings that had followed him onto the planet are, are waiting there. It's Dave Filoni and another pilot and they're firing at all the spiders. And the reason they've come back is because if you think back to season one, the Mandalorian did everything he could, despite breaking into, I guess it was called Bothan five, which was the ship that was the um, new Republic jail that they had a bunch of criminals on. Um, the Mandalorian uh, saved the 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 rebel pilot on that ship. And so, you know, it's like an, uh, what do you want to say, a give and take where like, yeah, you broke this guy out, but you also saved this guy. So we're going to save you now. And then that's the end of this relationship. We're kind of at even. Um, the, the X-Wing pilots shoot off all the spiders and they kind of leave the Mandalorian to fi- figure out how to get back home from there because um, they're not going to help them fix the ship. They're, they've done their job. They're, they're going on their way. They know that the Mandalorian doesn't have any, you know, he's, str- he's stranded. He, he doesn't have anything he can do to harm people at that point. Yeah, so the, the X-Wings take off and they leave the Mandalorian alone, but he's been saved, but now he's got to fix the ship on his own and he's, yeah, he's got to get to the next planet so the fr- frog lady can meet her, her mate, her husband. Yeah, I did like um, in that one scene where they're in the cockpit and, and the spider's about to bite Baby Yoda and then all of a sudden she breaks out a pistol and she starts firing and Mandalorian kind of looks over at her and is like, really, now you break out your pistol? And, I, and again, I love the ambiguity of the Mandalorian because he was basically saying, you know, this, this trip is over. There's no saving those chill, your, your spawn. Um, I, I've kind of given up. We're, we're not making it to that planet. We're broken down. And she's like, but it's your honor as a Mandalorian. He's like, yeah, I, I guess I, I got to you know, step up and take care of you now because you said that. And he does the whole dad thing where he's like, I guess I'm going to go fix it now. I wanted to get some sleep. but yep. uh, <laughs> And you see him walking around with a little bitty toolbox and you see the damage on the razor crest and you're like, dude, there's, there, just give up, man. There's no way you could fix it. So I guess in the next episode, when we saw the opening of the teaser trailer, when the, the razor crest is kind of limping through space towards that planet, I would imagine that's how this next episode, episode 11, chapter 11, will start. I, I really have a good feeling about that. Yeah, there's where else are they going to go? It, it, they, you know, they didn't want to, they couldn't travel light speed because I guess it would kill the eggs. So I'm kind of, you're curious how far away they are from a, from a planet, from the yep. next system. I, you know, you, you just don't know. I don't understand with, without, you understand light speed, but you don't understand the regular travel. Which is much slower and less efficient and more dangerous, I guess, because that's where pirates can come out and grab you because you're you're not in hyperspace. You're just in regular space and they can come grab you and, and raid you. I guess the Mandalorian, he's showing his sense of humor because he was, you know, like, wake me up. He was getting ready to, to crash for the night. And he was like, wake me up if pirates attack us or if that door falls off the hinges. And then he's like, ah, just kidding. That door flies off the hinges. We're all dead. Yeah, that was a funny episode, funny part of the episode. Yeah, that worked for me. They end it with Baby Yoda finding another egg and <laughs> stuffing it in his mouth. 
Yeah, it was a nice tag. He's just eating that last one like, I've got it. Yeah. He even I makes wonder, like a little burp noise, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, one of the scenes they do, because uh, I don't know if it's there, but when the Mandalorian catches him later, he asks, you know, how many have you eaten? And he definitely, he, he has that, the slime all over his mouth and he just burps. He looks at him and burps. They had its fun moments like that. I enjoyed it. It was, it, it's Star Wars. Even bad Star Wars is good. It's just like pizza. Right. Even bad pizza is good. Yeah, I think, again, it's just coming off of the hype from the last episode going into this. And this is, it's not that it's bad, but coming off the last one, it feels bad just because it doesn't have the excitement that I had, the, the, the buildup of seeing Boba Fett for the first time in years. You can't top that. So anything that they did, um, second to like seeing Luke Skywalker or something like that, it, it just wasn't going to be good for, for me. I really was hoping in that opening sequence, the way they were setting it up, that you'd see Boba Fett and it would start off where they, they left off. And you're, you're kind of wondering now, is, is Boba Fett just going to, you know, I hope that's not all we see of him. Yeah. You know, they definitely are, are going back to Tatooine. They, they, that's sort of, I think Tatooine has a lot more going for it in the Star Wars universe than we realize. Yeah. just because it always goes back to Tatooine. No, it feels like it's home plate for Star Wars that you always come back to it. You always want to go back to it. I know people complain it's a big universe. Why go back to this desert planet? Well, this desert planet, for some reason, one reason or another, seems to be important because that's where Anakin and Luke Skywalker came from. And it's where Ray buried the lightsabers, even though that's not hadn't happened yet. Yeah, I mean, it all comes back to that. Jack Hoo for for what it was is basically the clone of of Tatooine to the point it was just like why not put her back on Tatooine at that I don't know that's because Dave Filoni and John Favreau didn't direct those movies <laughs> yes number one and, <laughs> yeah and the reason why a lot of those cantina creatures don't make it into the sequel trilogy is because Dave Filoni and John Favreau didn't write those those movies it would have been good movies, but I, I think that with it being a TV show, they're getting their space that they need to create what they want. No, I agree with that, that they have a lot of runway. It's like an eight hour movie. You know, some of those hours aren't going to be as good as others. Not that it's bad, even at its worst, like you just said, Star Wars is still good. There's really not much more to say. This this episode is, it is what it is. It's just a, a th- I don't want to say throwaway episode because it's got negative connotation. Like you could throw it away and never see it again and you still get the, the understanding of what's going on in the Mandalorian. But at the same time, we don't know if it's got ramifications further down the, the season, um, but it doesn't seem to move the plot of the Mandalorian's search any further than it was just stuck on this planet for one episode. It's like, it's like the trapped in the elevator episode of, of sitcoms. There you go. What do you think we're going to see next episode? Well, I think we're going to see the squid heads. That would be cool. I think we're going to see them. If we're going back to that planet from the trailer, that water planet you were just talking about, because those were seen in the, in the trailer. So hopefully we see that. Hopefully we'll see Mon Calamari. If we're going to that planet, is it, Cal- is it Calamari? What is the name of that planet? The water planet. Mon Calamar. No, they, he didn't say Calamar, but maybe it's a different name or maybe they moved, migrated. But, uh, you know, you're definitely, I think you're going to see the boat. It's definitely a water planet and you're going to see that boat. And Maybe we'll figure out who that wrestler is. Uh, you know, I definitely think we're, we're on the path to seeing at least Bo-Katan yeah. uh, and, and figure it out. We're, we're, I think he's going to learn about the Darksaber this episode. The Darksaber will be mentioned in this next episode. My brother, who is, he likes Star Wars. He's not a fanatic like me. He just watched uh, chapters one through eight and he got to that scene with the Darksaber and he's like, what, what was that? And I explained it to him. He's like, do they expect me to know that? Do they expect me to, to know what that is and the importance of it? And I'm like, no, I only know that because I've watched the Clone Wars and Rebels. I would expect at some point they need to meet someone. The Mandalorian needs to meet someone to teach him about the Darksaber which would be Bo-Katan because she once had it. She was the last person to have it or Sabine. You know, someone needs to explain that aspect of the Mandalorian culture to the, to him. And I think Bo-Katan would be a great place to, to, to introduce not only that to the Mandalorian, but to the audience like my brother, who's never seen every single episode of the Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing if it's going to be Bo-Katan or Sabine or, you know, hell, maybe it even, it may even, be somebody that knows them, but I think there's been too much hype on those couple of characters. And then once you see Sabine, you're going to see Ahsoka. 
you know, how, or actually once you see Sabine, how long will it be before you see Ahsoka? Because that's where they left Rebels was with those two characters. And, and my guess, if I were to, if I was a betting man, I would bet whatever episode Dave Filoni directs is the episode that Ahsoka appears in. That's his baby. She is yeah. his baby. So I think that he would, you know, make sure that he got that piece of the the pie of season two. Dude, have you, uh, speaking of of well, Ahsoka and Ashley, and, and and we're I think we're like you said a minute ago, we're just running around in circles in this episode because yeah. you know it just it is what it is. Uh, but did you see that Ashley was down in Disney sell, uh, signing her lightsabers? Yeah, I got so excited when someone shared that that he was able to meet uh, Ashley Eckstein and have her sign. Um, his uh, legacy lightsaber box. I thought that was just an awesome thing. And it was just, it's always good to see Star Wars um, uh, content creators give back to fans like that. And that's just an amazing, it's part of Disney magic too. When you go to Disney and something great happens to you, um, they call it Disney magic. And so if you're walking through galaxy's edge and there's Ashley Eckstein um, just taking photos with, with fans. I mean, that, that right there is Disney magic at its best. I would be pretty excited to see her. Cause I don't know if she lives in Florida or not, but I know she posts from Disney world at least once a month that she's down there visiting. That's awesome. It, it would definitely be cool. The coolest thing when um, when we were down there in Galaxy's Edge, we didn't meet any Star Wars people, but that guy that does like the lottery homes or whatever on HDTV, you know, he'll take a lottery winner and he'll find him a home. Yeah. Uh, we saw that guy, the host of that show. And, and, you know, whenever I see somebody walking around with a hat or with glasses or trying to disguise <laughs> themselves, yeah. I pay attention because I'm like, that's somebody, that's probably somebody important. And he was walking through Galaxy's Edge, and I, my wife loves that show. And I'm like, babe, look, it's that guy. And she she lost it. Uh, but, you know, he was cool, and, and he took a picture with us. And, um, you know, it was, it was a cool little moment. Yeah, I once saw Terry Crews at Walt Disney World, at the Magic Kingdom. It was before I knew who Terry Crews was. It was I was with my sister-in-law and, and her new husband, and she pointed him out. And I'm like, who's, who's Terry Crews? And she's like, oh, he's this guy from whatever he was on at the time. And, you know, now it's like, oh, my God, that was Terry Crews, because I know exactly who Terry Crews is, and I think he's hilarious. Yeah, that, that, that is funny how that happens when you meet somebody and you have no clue who they are at the, at the moment, and then six months later they blow up. Well, Jason, I think that does it for this episode of the Smuggler's Galaxy. Uh, remind people how to find you on social media. Uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram, Jason Wasolko, W-A-S-U-L-K-O. You can visit my website, wasolko.com. Uh, I'll be posting some of the things that I got um, from my birthday on the Smuggler's Galaxy's Facebook page. Uh, make sure you like that and get the latest information from Glenn and I. Uh, I'm Glenn Williams. You can find me uh, Cajun Fett on Instagram. Find us Smugglers Galaxy on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, you can email us at smugglersgalaxy at Gmail. And uh, yeah, please email us some questions uh, if you've got any. We'll read them on the air and, and talk about them. We should do a listener question uh, episode at some point. I don't know about what, but you know, if you have any questions for us, we'll do our best to yap and answer them. Yeah, that'd be fun. Let's let's get some uh, let's sort of questions in, and we'll do one uh, down the road once we get through this Mandalorian season. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jason, you have a great uh, rest of your day, and this is the way. This is the way. <laughs>